a reading from the book of Genesis. The Lord God formed man out of the clay of the ground and blew into his nostrils the breath of life, and so man became a living being. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east and placed there the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God made various trees grow that were delightful to look at and good for food, with the tree of life in the middle of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the animals that the Lord God had made. The serpent asked the woman, did God really tell you not to eat from any of the trees in the garden? The woman answered the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. It is only about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden that God said, you shall not eat it or even touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you certainly will not die. No, God knows well that the moment you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like gods who know what is good and what is evil. The woman saw that, that the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eyes and desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some of its fruit and ate it, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. transgressions wash me completely from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin My transgressions, truly I know them. My sin is always before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned. What is evil in your sight I have done?
a reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, through one man sin entered the world, and through sin death, and thus death came to all men, inasmuch as all sinned. For up to the time of the law, sin was in the world, though sin is not accounted when there is no law. But death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who did not sin, after the pattern of the trespass of Adam, who is the type of the one who, has, who, who was to come. But the gift is not like the transgression, for if by the, the, the transgression of the one the many died, how much more did the grace of God and the gracious gift of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow for the many. And the gift is not like the result of the one who sinned. For after one sin, there was the judgment that brought condemnation. But the gift, after many transgressions, brought acquittal. For if, by the transgression of the one, death came to reign through that one, how much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of justification come to reign in life through the one Jesus Christ? In conclusion, just as through one transgression, condemnation came upon all, so through one righteous act, acquittal and life came to all. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. With Proclamation from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord. At that time, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Afterwards, he was hungry. The tempter approached him and said to him, If you are the Son of God, Command that these stones become loaves of bread. And he said in reply, it is written, one does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, made him stand on the parapet of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you with their hands they will support you, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Then the devil took him up a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their magnificence, said to him, all these I shall give to you if you will prostrate yourself and worship me. At this, Jesus said to him, get away, Satan. It is written, the Lord, your God, shall you worship. God alone shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. 
The Gospel of the Lord. wanted to tell you that when I was a seminarian that was in Chicago and we had a basic ministry and an advanced ministry and my advanced ministry was to go to a church called St. Peter's in the Loop, downtown Chicago. It was frequented by all kinds of different people, businessmen and bag ladies and housewives and homeless, all kinds of different people. Well, on Ash Wednesday, so many people would come to St. Peter's in the Loop that literally they lined up outside the building all around the, the whole city block. Five or six of us at a time were giving out ashes. So many people were enthused about Lent and wanted to participate in Lent. And that's kind of the way it is at the beginning of Lent. People come out of the woodwork. They go to church, they go on retreats, they're very enthusiastic. But as Lent wears on, enthusiasm wears off. Unfortunately, people fade away. You see, what happens is at the beginning of Lent, you want this experience of God and you want change to happen. And then when things don't happen as quickly as you want them to, all of a sudden you get tempted, tempted to kind of give up, tempted to let go of your resolutions and people fade away. You have to understand something. Jesus was in the desert for 40 days and nights. That's a long time. And of course, he was hungry after that. And in the same way, Lent is not a sprint. It's a marathon. It lasts a good long time. We are in it for the long haul. And we have to get that in our heart. You have to realize that it's not just a little sprint. It demands perseverance, endurance, and patience. Otherwise, what God wants to do in us won't happen. It's not going to happen in a day. There's no microwave maturity. We need time to be transformed. I love what the 12-step program says, one day at a time. One day at a time. Let God work in you today. And over this season of endurance, watch what happens, transformation. Change may not happen immediately, but it'll happen eventually if you don't give up. And I don't think you are the ones who give up because you're watching and you're here this morning. And we're in it for the long haul. We're not in it alone, folks. We are journeying, journeying pilgrimaging with millions and millions of other Catholic Christians. We're all on this together, and we have to endure. We have to be strong. The devil's going to try to tempt us away. Don't let him. I believe that this Lent can be significant and life-changing, your best Lent ever. Now, Lent is a season of personal change and growth. That's what we're about. It demands introspection. We need to look within to see where we need to grow. And I want to put a question before you. Are you stuck in some area? That's what I hear from people all the time. Father, I feel stuck. Well, as we begin Lent, are you stuck in an area such as a habitual sin? Well, let's take a look at that. Could be anger or lust or gluttony, eating too much sugar, an addiction of some sort like drinking or drugs or gambling or pornography and a resentment toward another person, you're not forgiving them. Take a look at whatever your issue is and Lent is proclaiming that you can change. That's the great, wonderful grace about Lent. We are changing, as the Bible says, from glory to glory. Now, you don't have to stay stuck. That's another one of the temptations of the devil. He thinks he tells you you can't change and you're going to stay stuck all your life. Well, you can change. And we are changing, not just physically, but morally, spiritually, emotionally. We can change. We don't have to stay stuck. 
You see, the Catholic documents tell us that Lent is a time of purification and enlightenment. And I want you to get that because that's what this homily is all about. The goal of Lent, purification, personal change, and enlightenment. And I'll get to that in just a minute. That's something called ongoing conversion. People are converted, you know, when you come to Jesus and give your heart to him and there's that initial conversion. Maybe it was at your baptism or you had an experience, whatever, and you really gave your heart to Christ. But there's ongoing transformation. And that's what Lent is. It's a time for us to pilgrimage, to journey, to endure. And that's part of it too. Just patience and endurance is part of the growth. Ongoing conversion. Now, I've been a missionary priest here in the United States for over 30 years. I preach parish missions. Next week, I'll be down in Jupiter, Florida, preaching. Well, people want to change, and they don't know how. <laughs> how do you do it? Well, first of all, let me tell you this. You have to be motivated. You really got to be motivated. Because if you're not motivated, change really isn't going to happen, personal change. You are, you are going to stay stuck. Now, on Ash Wednesday, remember a couple days ago, when you were ashed, those of you who went to the services, the minister said something to you. He said, remember, man or woman, that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now, what is the church saying in that? The church is trying to remind us that we are mortal and that we are going to die. Therefore, be motivated to change. The church is trying to motivate us by our own mortality. I remember it was St. Benedict, the great founder of Western monasticism, founded all these monasteries. In his rule, St. Benedict, in the Benedictine rule, he put in a clause, a, a statement to his monks. He told his monks, every day remember your death. Now, why would he tell that to his monks? Because, and I want you to get this now, the purpose of life is to prepare for your death. This is not rocket science. Really simple. It's not hard to understand. The purpose of your life and my life is to prepare for your own death and meeting God. Really important. And that's what Lent is. It's a season of preparation. We prepare for Easter, of course. But most of all, we're preparing for our own death and coming before the beatific vision. And we have to be ready. And that's why we have this season of grace, the season of Lent. Our own death is certainly a motivation to change our mortality. But more than that, what's our prime motivation? Why do we want to move and change and be purified? Because we love God. We love God. Here am I, Lord, I come to do your will. Do in me what I can't do. I love you, Lord. Isn't that why we're here this morning? Isn't that why you're watching on TV? We turn away from sin, we seek purity because we love God. That's our prime motivation. And if you want to change, you've got to be motivated. Now, the two main purposes of Lent, as I said in the Catholic documents, purification, personal change. I already talked to you a little bit about that. Got to be motivated, can't stay stuck, got to keep moving because you love God, because you're going to die. And then enlightenment, purification and enlightenment. Not hard to understand, very simple. What was Jesus doing in the desert for 40 days? Of course, we heard he was being tempted, but primarily he was praying. <laughs> he was praying for those 40 days and 40 nights. That's a long period of time. He was concentrating on God, focusing on God, giving his attention to God, and achieving really transcendent communion with God. The way I like to say it is, go from the superficial to the supernatural. And that's what the season of Lent is all about too. It's about our relationship with God. It's about personal change, but it's about enlightenment. I studied in the Holy Land way back when, in the seminary, went to the Judean desert. 
And I was struck by the, the barrenness of the Judean desert. They have the Mount of Temptation there. There's a monastery there. I was struck by the barrenness, but also by the quiet, the deafening quiet, the sheer silence in the desert. No traffic, no cell towers, no airplanes, no iPhones, no computers. Don't be scandalized by silence. It's the language of God's love. Can I invite you during your Lenten journey, just for a couple minutes every day, to get quiet? And try to not think about anything. I know it's hard, you get distracted. But silence is what the great saints have taught us. It's God's language. And in silence, what happens is I have a computer and sometimes it gets sluggish. You gotta restart it every once in a while. That's what silence does for me. It gets me going efficiently, it gets me grounded and rooted, it gets me centered. Silence. Because there's so much noise. And Lent is a time to get quiet, to get silence. Here's a few words for you. Calm, peace, Tranquility, serenity, healing, enlightenment, illumination. Don't be afraid of silence. That's what Jesus was doing in the desert. He wasn't just talking. <laughs> Prayer is communication. It's speaking, but it's listening. Really important. It's getting quiet. You may not hear anything but it makes you susceptible to hearing, really important. You see, Jesus was on retreat. I live at a retreat center. This is a place in Houston, Texas, Holy Name Retreat Center. Right now there's 80 women on retreat where I live. And there are retreats going on all around the country. And a retreat is a time to face your issues, make good decisions, but most of all, a retreat is a time to get close to God. To spend time with God, get to know God, develop your love relationship. That's what prayer is. Develop your love relationship with God, your personal relationship with God. Jesus was on retreat in the desert. And that's how Lent originally began. It was a retreat for the catechumens, for the elect, as they approached Easter. And now we retreat with them for the 40 plus days, plus Sundays. We retreat with them. And what is a retreat? What's the purpose of a retreat? A time to deepen your relationship with God. Personal change, purification, and enlightenment. Prayer is a pillar of Lent, isn't it? Prayer, fasting, almsgiving. Prayer is where you deepen your love relationship with God, as I said. In addition to silence, how do you pray? Certainly we speak and intercede and praise and give thanks. But one of the ways that I pray is simply by reading the mass readings every day. Just read the readings. God speaks through his word. Read good spiritual books. I like this quote that I saw. A mind once stretched by a book will never return to its original size. And that's so true. You see, Lent is meant to stretch us both in our moral life, our spiritual life. Be stretched. Allow yourself to be moved, to be led by the Spirit. Holy Spirit, lead me, guide me, control me. So spend a little time reading. Reading is a prayer. It really is. Just spending time with a good spiritual book, reading the scriptures, and then what about watching television? Certainly, as you watch the programs on EWTN, that's, a sp that's prayer, listening. You're listening to the homily right now. You are praying right now as you listen. By the way, just to let you know, I now have a program on e EWTN every Sunday, 6.30 a.m. Eastern Time. I'll be talking more about Lent every Sunday, 6.30 a.m. Eastern Time. The foundation of Lent is purification and personal transformation and enlightenment, getting closer to God. That's, it's real simple. Purification, it's twofold. Purification, 
enlightenment. And that's what Lent is all about, and that's what Jesus was doing in the desert. He was being tempted, purified, and he was being enlightened, getting closer to God. Remember, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. We must endure. We must persevere. We must be patient. Do not let the devil tempt you away. And I believe that as you are motivated and go in wholeheartedly, you will experience a significant, life-changing Lent, perhaps your best ever. I wanted to leave you, as I conclude, with a story about my own conversion. I was born and brought up Catholic in Massachusetts, but as a teenager, fell away. But God called me back in many different ways. And one of the ways that he called me back was through a musical, through a play. And you've all heard of it. It's called Godspell. I went to the old Charles Theater in Boston. I was invited to go to this play, and I went there. And at the time, I wasn't even going to church. And if you know anything about this play, it's the Gospel of Matthew acted out <clears throat> with music, with humor. That play helped change my life. I heard the gospel through music, through acting, through humor, and it was powerful. And it has led me to a conversion and now to ongoing conversion. And there was a song that was sung during that play that really summarizes Lent, and I want to leave you with it. It was called Day by Day. And it goes like this, day by day, day by day. O oh, dear Lord, three things I pray. To see thee more clearly, love thee more dearly, follow thee more nearly, day by day. <laughs>